Uh, today I'm going to talk about semi-random units for learning neural networks with guarantees. And this is joint work with Yin Yu, Kenji, and Li. So as we know, neural networks are very success successful in learning many nonlinear functions, and has wide applications in, for example, computer vision, uh, natural language processing. And most of the neural networks are trained with simple stochastic gradient descent. And uh, however, the objective function is high, highly nonlinear, uh, highly non-convex, with <coughs> possibly numerous local optimal and failure points. So the intriguing problem we want to ask is, why in practice SGD works so well for, to train neural networks? So this is, in this talk, I'm going to give, give some uh, first attempt to solve this question. So we look at one particular model, which is one hidden layer neural net with ReLU activation functions. And the first layer ways are called, uh, called W case, and the second layer ways are the V case. And this function is parameterized as follows, fx. And the sigma is the ReLU activation function. We optimize this uh, least squares loss over a bunch of m data points. So the main without is that for some nice configurations of the neural ways, the w's, and with high probability, we can guarantee that any stationary point will be a global optimal. So we start by analyzing the structure of the gradient. So the gradient with respect to the first layer way, wk, is as follows. And we can, so this is for, for one particular wk. If you stack all the gradient together into a long vector, and we can rewrite them in a matrix form, then, then we have this special matrix where each column corresponds to one data point, and there are n times d rows where n is the hidden units and d is the input dimension. And this one is the uh, residual vector where each entry is the difference between the function prediction and the, the target. So for simpler location, uh, notation, so this is the concatenated long gradient vector is equal to this special matrix we call D times the residual vector. So and, and, and the stationary point, the gradient will be zero. And somehow if the D matrix is non-singular, then immediately we will have this R, the residual vector will be zero, which means it's a global optimal. So in this talk, I'm go, going to give some c conditions under which this D will be non-singular. And this is the, intu the intuition is that this key inequality, where this norm of the R is upper bounded by the norm of the gradient, and also related to the inverse of the minimum singular value of D. That is, if you, if you have a small gradient norm, and we have a lower bound on the smallest singular value of D, then the training error is upper bounded. And gradient descent will minimize this gradient norm. So we can directly try to analyze the singular value of D matrix, which is, uh, <coughs> yeah, we can look at the GM matrix, which is D transpose D. And it is, note, note that it is the function of, of the weight. So uh, it is kind of difficult to analyze directly. So that's why we introduce an intermediate variable, G, where I assume the weights are uniform, random. And then we take, take expectation of them. So this intermediate variable, G, is no longer a function of the weight, or the actual weight. Then the spectrum that we care about can be decomposed in two parts. Is the spectrum of G, which does not depend on the actual weights, and the difference between G and GN. What's the distribution of the weights? The expectation. So it's, it's the uniform of the sphere. Okay. Yeah. So to bound the first term, so note that G is a m by m matrix, and we look at the IJS entry, which uh, consists of inner product between xi and xj and the expectation of these nonlinearities. So for ReLU activation function, this nonlinearity will be an indicator function. And we can calculate this expectation analytically, which only depends on the angle between xi and xj. And note that this function also only depends on the inner product between xi and xj. So it's an inner product kernel. And we can suppose, well, assume the data point also normalized on a unit sphere. Then we can, we can write this spherical harmonic decomposition. 
where we have this gamma, gamma u is the spectrum of this kernel function. So basically, the, the idea is that this, this gn depends on data set, and if the <coughs> data set, the number of data points increases, you will concentrate on the spectrum of the kernel function. So for the, the bound for the first term is that the, G, the spectrum of the g is related to the spectrum of the kernel, gamma m. And in practice, the spectrum of the variable function is actually in between order one over m or one over one over, one over m square root m. Now let's bound the second term, which is the difference between g and g n. And is it upper bounded by some function of this L2 W, which is to call the weight discrepancy. So the weight discrepancy is defined as follows. It's the pairwise similarity be between the weight w, Wi and Wj measured by this kernel, where this kernel is, is related to this re rectified linear function, and also minus this expected quantity. So the reason, the intuition behind this is, is that the G, G is about expect, expected quantity, and GN is about the actual weights. So the difference is upper bounded by the quantity which depends on expected um, weights and uh, the actual weights. So to put, to put the two terms together, we have a lower bound on the singular value of D, and for a simplified result, suppose n, which is the number of hidden units, and d, which is the input dimension, are large enough, and the weight discrepancy, L2w, is small enough. In particular, if n is 1 over gamma, gamma m, and d is 1 over gamma n, and L2w is in, in this order, then we have a simplified bound, then with high probability, this uh, smallest single value is uh, lower bounded by linear in number of data points. So here we don't we don't talk about uh, the true model yet. So this is all just this particular uh, the W does not is not related to the, the true generated model. So so we. <coughs> so here does not concern anything about the true generated uh, weight. I'm trying to understand. Yeah, the hyperpity is over, over the data points. So with the hyperpity is related to, to all the xi's, or the data points, xi's. Uh, is w random? W is random? W right now is a particular uh, weight. It's a, any particular weight. Uh, is that random or not? It's not random. Is the, of your optimization problem? I mean, uh, the, doesn't the fact that you take the gradient equal to zero, doesn't it couple the weights and the random points? Yeah, that's right. That's a point I'll, I'll address later. So for now, I just assume any, any particular uh, particular W weight. And then if this, if uh, as a solution, if this W has a low discrepancy, then this also uh, holds in the, in the solution. But the, key, the key is that we have, want to have this uh, small, small weight discrepancy so it's like a certificate of global optimality. Is that's what that's where you're heading, right? Uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah. So you can compute it, and it's a certificate. Right. But uh, yeah. So let me let me talk about more about this. So, so to get a final error, if uh, using the same assumptions, we can have a bound on the training error, which is uh, on the square root norm of the gradient. <laughs> so that means uh, if you have a small gradient, then we have a small error. So to talk about a bit more about this uh, W business. So in most W, we actually satisfy this uh, low discrepancy. But we are not really, uh, there's one point that we are not sure yet if the, the solution obtained by gradient descent or any other optimization algorithm will actually have a small uh, weight discrepancy. So that's the still a gap. That's, the, that's for future work. But you still need to soup over all those Ws in those class of small weight discrepancies, right? Uh, excuse me? I mean, here the W that for which you proved it, you proved it for each individual set of, of weights in this class, right? Mm -hmm. but, uh, this will depend on your on your on your x l and y l, right? Yeah. So no, no. So W is so so I define a set which has small weight discrepancy. So for any W that has small weight discrepancy. For uniformly <coughs> this set. So yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah, but we have we have, we have see that most W will satisfy a small lead equivalency, but we are not sure if those particular points arise by gradient descent will actually have small discrepancy. So there's still uh, further research to, to be done but on, on that part. Yeah, and in principle it is. Yeah. So you have more weights than examples, right? More weights than examples? Yeah. So we can, yeah, I will talk about it. So the n is the number of hidden units, and d is the input dimension. So the, the typically it should be, uh, have a requirement should be in you know, order square root m and m m. So we actually in in this over parameterized region, where n times d is the total number of parameters is slightly bigger than the total number of data points. And yeah, to recap, that we analyze the one hidden error, the optimization landscape of one hidden error in your network, and then show that we have probability if the, the configuration of the weights are nice, in particular have a low weight discrepancy, then any stationary point would, with high probability would be a global optimal. But the key technical difficulty is that we are don't, currently we don't have any guarantee for any for the op, for the points arrived by the optimization algorithm, you actually have a small weight equivalency. So then next, we describe the semi-random units to address this issue. So as we discussed before, the difficulty comes from the non-linearity part. But you can think about a ReLU function as, a, as two parts, where it has a non-linear part and this linear part. So for semi-random units, we replace this non the W in the non-linear part by random projection by R, that is, is the the, <coughs> the nonlinearity only depends on random parameter, and we don't optimize that, but we only optimize the linear function. So that uh, in this case, the D matrix will only consist of, of functions of, of R's, but not D. So you will not change as the during the process progress of uh, optimization. So why not just raise a random coin toss? Huh? It's just a random coin toss, right? Yeah. It is uh, just a maybe Gaussian, yeah. Random coin. So ADK yeah. is just a zero one with probability one half, right? Yeah. So wait, is R shared by different indicators? Uh, yeah. So th this R is uh, for any unit, for any so for any hidden unit, I have a one R. So if there are n hidden units, I have an R. So it's like a random coin toss. It's just so random. It's, 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 it's fixed. Yeah. Correlated because it depends on the input. Yeah. X. It depends on the input x. No, so, no it's, it's a fixed R. You, you fix it at the beginning, and you don't you don't optimize it. You don't only optimize W. Got it. Yeah. Initially. Right. right, right. So in this setting, then this D matrix will be will, with high probability satisfy the low weight discrepancies uh, condition. And this is a figure of this uh, semi-random unit on the 2D case, where this threshold, this direction of the threshold is de determined by R, and you can adjust this part freely. And here are some properties of this semi-random unit. So it sits between the fully random features, which is random projection, and from then nonlinearity, which are used a lot in curl methods and between these fully adjustable units used in neural networks. And so we kind of compromise the trade-off between these two kind of uh, units. Okay. It's also linear in the number of parameters, but non-linear in, in the input. And according to previous analysis, it's guaranteed to converge to the global optimum with high probability, and also has universal approximation ability. Next, we're going to show some uh, experimental results. And we see these semi-random features are not as flexible as uh, ReLU, but we can use in slightly more unit to match the performance of value. So this data are experiment result on two data sets, and the blue dots are the value, and the red dots are the semi-random features. And these green ones are the fully random features. As we can see, is using only slightly more units, it can match the performance of value, but compared with random feature, random feature requires many more units. And then another interesting property is the trade-off between width and depth. 
So given the same number, fixed number parameter, we can distribute it using more layers or using more, param more units per layer. And this experiment shows that if you use four layer architecture, it actually achieves lower, lower error compared with the two layer and also one layer architecture. So it shows that using run, for run, semi-random features, this deeper, they also have this trade-off between uh, width and depth, and usually depth helps. And then some more uh, experiments on real-world data sets for image classification. You, the, for we, so we, basically we run convolutional neural net and we replace the uh, matrix multiplication, the random, random units with semi-random units and the fully random units. And we can again see with slightly more units, we can match the performance of ReLU, whereas in random feature, even using many, many more units, there's still a huge gap between the performance uh, of ReLU. And in conclusion, we have uh, analyzed a one hidden layer neural network, and, and this weight, this weight <coughs> small weight discrepancy condition, any critical point with high probability with a global optimal, and the result depends on the spectral decay of this kernel associated with the value activation function. And then we have also proposed the semi-random features. And these features are guaranteed to converge to the global optimal with high probability. And then also show that using slightly more units, we can match the performance of value. But then for fully random features, it has many, many more uh, units. Thanks. So uh, ReLU is uh, non-smooth, so what happens in points when the gradient is not well defined? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, this, this kind of uh, points are very small subset compared with the whole points. So uh, in particular, we, we only use, actually we use the subgradient to define the, uh, the It's not convex. Yeah. So no, at, at, the, at the point zero, we, use the, we define the gra each gradient to be zero. But at this point, a very small compared with all the points. And if you use stochastic gradient descent, then you <coughs> mostly likely will not run into those points. Depending <coughs> on how exactly you define the gradient, there might be a critical point, like a uh -huh. local minimum, where however you define the gradient, it was non-zero, but it's still a critical point, so. Yeah, but also, also our result is not Actually, about a particular point is about a neighborhood where the error is small. So, for many points around that neighborhood, we can control this error. So, you don't, you're not, um, I don't think it will be very sensitive to, to, to that point. To be more precise, you can just define it, uh, define the, the gradient value at that uh, uh, zero point, and, that, and then the, or some other value, and then the whole argument still holds. So basically, the, the conclusion. Any questions? Okay, thanks very much.